Welcome. Today we will start with the chapter 3 of the Beasts of Prey. The smallest resistance. No matter how many times she would face it over the years, Kofi had always dreaded the hammer. She gnawed on her bottom lip, unease rising as she watched its crimson folds flutter in the breeze, noting the violating the way its central pole impaled the maiden night sky like a gilded spear. Her steps dragged as she and Mama moved to join the queue of beast keepers, waiting to enter it with their assigned beasts. Almost over. She thought this is almost over. Once, in another era, she supposed the massive tent might have been considered grand, even impressive to some, but time had taken a visible toll. Tears in the seams hadn't been mended, and rust coated most of the metal stakes hammered into the grass to keep it secure. Attendants at the night zoo had, like many things in Lacosa over the years, steadily declined and it showed. Smile. Mama reminded her, guiding them to their place in line as several of other beast keepers took cautionary steps back. Coffee twisted her mouth to form a half grimace she hoped would suffice. Bars required all beast keepers of the night zoo to look cheerful during shows and notoriously punish those who didn't with a shiver. She thought of the whipping post not so far from here. The curiosity of it, the bizarreness of being forced to look happy about handling creatures who could kill you as soon as look at you, was one thing she wouldn't miss about working here. Don't forget to check Deco's harness, said Mama. Make sure it's secure before we hike off. Coffee looked up, a genuine smile tugging at her lips now. A boy of about 14 was approaching them fast, surrounded by a pack of wild dogs. He had bright, intelligent brown eyes and a permanently cheeky grin. Hi, Jabir. How? Upon seeing the wild dogs, Deco hissed his multicolored scales, rippling as he eyed them. Mama pulled him away with a disapproving look. Jabir, she said sternly, those dogs are supposed to be on leashes. Ma, they don't need them. Jabir's smile didn't falter. They're well trained. Didn't one of them poop in Buzz Bar's slippers the other day? Jabir's mouth twitched. Like I said, they're well trained. A real laugh bubbled in Coffee's throat. Followed by a shot of unexpected pain, Jabir was her closest friend at the night zoo. Like a brother to her in some ways, she watched him drop to his knees to play with the dogs. Leaving the night zoo would mean leaving him too. She didn't relish having to tell him the news, but she had to. It would be better if he heard from it from her. Jabir, she started tentatively. I need to tell you some. Did you hear about tonight's visitors? Jabir smirked the way he usually did. He was about to gossip. One of his jobs at the zoo was to run errands for bars. So he always had news first. No, said Coffee. Momentarily distracted, what about them? It's some merchant couple visiting from the Baridi region. He said, apparently they are pretty rich. Baz is angling for a patronage. I saw them coming in. The old man seems okay, but the wife walks like she's got stick up her. Jabir. Coffee snorted as Jabir offered Mama a sheepish smile. His word lingered in her mind as she looked around as more beastkeepers gathered. She hadn't noticed before, but far more animals were out of their cages tonight, and the grounds did look like they had gotten an extra bit of grooming. If this merchant couple did agree to a patronage, it would add not only prestige but new revenue for the zoo. Baz would be especially anxious tonight. A dulcet chorus of voices suddenly rose from the inside of tent, beautiful and harmonic. At once all three of them stilled. Those were the night zoos, indentured musicians, their song meant the show had officially commenced. It took only seconds for a thunderous percussion of goatskin drums to join the singing, and instinctively, Coffee's own heart attuned to their pounding cadence. She looked up when the musical overture ended, and it in place an anticipatory silence waited the air. Excellent, said someone inside the tent. A lovely performance from the choir. Coffee recognized the booming showman's voice that was Baz. If you enjoyed that, Bawana Mutugana. 
You are sure to marvel at the beauties I have in store for you tonight, though of course they will all pale in comparison to your lovely wife. By Mutunga, words could never be your radiant justice. Kofi barely managed not to roll her eyes. Baz was using Bawana and Bai, the more formal honorifies of the Zamani language, clearly trying to impress. The henna canvas was too thick for Kofi's to discern anything from outside. But she heard what sounded like two sets of hands offering polite applause as the musicians existed the tent. Two, only two guests. Baz would have told them that this was part of their exclusive experience. But she knew better. No one else had showed up. Cancelled shows due to lack of attendance seemed to happen more and more often lately. After a moment, her master spoke again. Now, as I am sure you are both here, my spectacular night zoo boasts the widest array of speciality creatures in the region, the likes of which you have never. Just show us the animals, said a heavily assented female voice. We do not plan to be here all evening. There was an awkward pause. Then, of course, right away, by Mutunga, may I now present without further ado the parade of beasts. It was a cue. And no sooner had Baz spoken the words than he was pushing open the Hema's front entrance flap. Kofi tensed on principle on the side of him. To his credit, Baz Matombe certainly looked like the owner of a spectacular night zoo. Everything about him seemed larger than life, like a caricature. He was a mountain of a man with deep oak brown skin and mane of thick black and blonde dreadlocks that stuck out in every direction. With his red dahiski and fake silk slippers, he looked jolly if not slightly overdressed. Kofi knew better than to disbelieve the ruse. Move! He beckoned the first beast keepers in the line as they struggled to guide a pair of silver black gorillas into the tent by their harnesses, just as we have rehearsed big smiles. The line ahead of them began moving into the tent and Kofi swallowed. There was nothing to be afraid of, really. Shows were the same every time and this one would likely be. One of her last. Still, she was oddly nervous, all too soon. She, Mama and Diko, reached the Hamas entry. She tried not to inhale Ba's spicy clone as it ducked past him. And then, they were inside. If the outside of the Hema reflected... What the old tent had once been, the interior clung of its former grandeur with the desperate grip. Its decor was slightly dated, furnished with the old animal prints, throws and well-worn chases. Carefully arranged candlelight gave the place a flickering golden glow while also hiding some of the more stubborn stains in the rugs. And the heady scent of palm wine just barely masked the stench of animals past and present. A massive statue of a peacock carved from turquoise was arranged in one corner, and in the center, an open space was designated as a stage. A well-dressed couple sat before it, waiting on a plush red divan. The man looked old enough to be Kofi's grandfather. His skin was dark and wrinkled, his cropped hair nearly white. His wore a plum-colored dashiki Kofi knew at once was expensive despite its subtly and he exuded the air of someone senior and refined. Beside him, his wife was the opposite, uncomfortably young and gaudy. She seemed partial into the color green because she was covered in it from her wax print dress to the glittering jade beads clacking at the ends of her box braids. She pinched her nose as Coffee and Mama entered the tent with Diko, and an embarrassed heat crept up Coffee's neck. Jabir followed behind with his wild dog and Baz came in last. Ladies and gentlemen, he said the practice word as though he was dressing millions of instead of an audience of two. For your delectation and delight, I present you the many creatures of my spectacular night zoo. Tonight we will take a your journey through the wilds of the southern marshlands, the ferocities of the great jungle, even spicemen's procured from the farthest reaches of the western waste, first the Guemala. Kofi relaxed a little as she and Mama moved to a space against the tent's wall while two beast keepers ushered the camel-like Guemala to its center. 
They walked it in circles several times, letting the merchant and his wife admire the shiny black spikes running down the length of its back, each one sharp enough to draw blood. From the Kosogada, Plains Baz narrated, the Gomala is a herbivore and can survive weeks without water. They are graceful creatures and the story goes that a western princess once used the spike of one for a love potion. Coffee let Baz stories about the night zoo's creatures, some true, most fake, blend together as more animals were summoned one by one. He told particularly gruesome story about the silver black gorillas when they were called up next. Then shared a folk tale about Impendulus when a young male beast keeper came forward with one perch on his arm. She held her. She held her breath as the reckoning hyena was brought forth when muzzled its cackle above could paralyze the human body. But fortunately, Baz did not suggest a live demonstration soon enough. He was looking to Jabir. And now for a special local treat, he said proudly, May I present Jabir and his lacos and wild dogs a surge of pride ran through coffee as jabir stepped forward with his fluffy brown dog and offered both a smile and a cordial bow to motognas while she didn't care much for the night zoo show jabir took them in stride a natural performer he raised a hand fingers dancing through the air a complicated array of signals and at once the dog stilled coffee smiled jabir's expertise was in the known verbal commands as he could train almost anything with them. He pointed two fingers and the dogs began to run around him in a perfect circle. He closed fist, then directed them to rise to their hind legs and yip. Bawana Mutunga Quartered as one of the dogs faced him and bent its four legs in an unmistakable bow while other hoped. Adorably in place, Coffee felt another pang. These were the moments she would miss. Jabi demonstrated a few more tricks before clapping his hands and signaling for the dogs to stop and sit. He offered a deep finishing bow while the merchant applauded. Well, well, said Bwana Mutunga. That was quite impressive, young man. Jabi grimmed before herding his dogs off stage and letting Baz resume his position. One of the zoo's upcoming stars, Baz said, beaming, and there's more yet to see. For our next act, my love, coffee glance up to the sea. The Merchant Wife by Mutunga Fanning the air with a distinctly impatient expression, she addressed her husband, It's getting late. Perhaps we should return to the caravan. But Ba's voice faltered. But surely, you'll stay. Just a little longer, I haven't even given you the full tour of the grounds yet, an exclusive offer for patrons only. Ah, I'm afraid my younger better half is right. Ba's Bawana Mutunga gave his wife a doting look. Like her, his accented word had the trick. Choppy cut of Baridian, a northerner, I have business at the temple tomorrow morning. Perhaps you could discuss a patronage next time. Baz wrung his hands, anxious. But you haven't even seen our grand finale yet. He addressed the merchant's wife. I think you will particularly interested in this one. Bye, Mutunga. If I could just have ten more minutes of your time. Five. Bamutunga's expression didn't change. Perfect. Baz clapped his hands at once, revitalized. Coffee knew what was coming next, but still jolted when her master's eye shot to her. Many I now present. Diko, the Chocomoto. Just keep calm. Coffee willed the words as she had Mama let Diko forward together. She held his leash, but Mama stayed at her side. Therefore, back up. You have done this away hundred times, coffee reasoned. Easy. Just like you are always done. Slowly, they guided Diko around the perimeter of a stage. In the candlelight, his scales shimmered in an almost mesmerizing way. Though, she didn't dare to look up. She heard the merchant's soft sighs of all. What an exquisite creature, said Bawana Matunga. Baz, where did you say this was one from? Ah. There was renewed excitement in Ba's voice. Jokomotos come from the Katili desert of the West. They are exceedingly rare bees these days. Speaking of bees, Bawana Mutunga interrupted Kofi Chance a look at him. As she and Mama have made another lap, is it true that the Shetani got one of her keeper's bars? I heard it went another rampage last night, killed eight people. 
coffee faltered in her steps as he hushed fall over the tent. She knew without looking that every beekeeper in the vicinity would have been stilled at the mention of Sahel, waiting to hear Baz's answer to the question. It's true. Baz kept his stone light, but the boy did choose to run away, but he was a fool to leave my generous protection. Coffee's free hand curled into a fist. But she kept walking for the merchant's power. When Coffee looked at him, he was chuckling into his tea. That would be quite an addition to your show, would it not? Coffee saw unmistakably. Longing flashed across her master's feature. Well, a man can dream, he said wistfully, but I think I would have to barter my soul for such an acquisition. I must admit, the merchant balanced the procrelane cup of his knee. The abomination has been something of a boon for my business. Baz, I brightened. Remind me again what you said to trade it in. Bovana, priceless jewels, fine textiles. Bona Matunga gave Baz an intentional look. I didn't say, but it's neither. He corrected. My specialty is in administrative supplies, quills, Baridian Inc., the Temple of Lakosa alone constitutes a quarter of my business, what with all books and maps they had housed there. Naturally, Boz knew it, as though he knew all about such things. I used to have to price match against my competitors. Bawana Matunga went on, but now most of them fear traveling to Lakosa, so I have the monopoly. It's been a blessing. Boz's expression held visibly greed. Well, Bawana let me the First, to wholeheartedly congratulate you on your prosperity. Coffee fought to hold her stage smile in place, but it felt more and more like a scowl. The shitani was no blessing to the people of Lakosa. It was a menace. Anyone who saw such a monster as good as no better than dirt, in her opinion. She thought of Sahil now, small he would look in his shroud. He would run from the night zoo and into the greater jungle because he would felt like he had no choice. Some people wouldn't understand that. Baz had called him a fool, but she knew better. She knew that poverty could be a different kind of monster, always lurking and waiting to consume. For some death was a kind of beast, not that man like these to understand that. I wonder, I wonder, Baz, Bawana Matunga was now leaning forward into his chair. Could we have a closer look at the Jokomoto? Baz perked up. Of course, he turned to coffee and her mother. Girls bring Diko over for our guests to see. At his words, coffee froze. Usually, they just paraded Diko around the stage a few times, so this was a break from the routine. Instinctively, she met Mama's eye, but the mother. But the mother didn't look worried. She nodded, and together they guided Diko toward the merchant and his wife, stopping a foot in front of them. Fascinating. Bawana Matunga moved his teacup to a side table, and is actually stood to examine Diko. At the sudden mention, the Jokomoto tense but didn't move. Easy boy, Coffee kept her eyes trained on Diko, willing him to behave himself. Easy, does it? If Babana Matunga was impressed, his wife was decidedly not. She inhaled, she wrinkled her nose again. It stinks, she declared. She pulled a small perfume bottle from a bag at her side and sprayed into the air excessively in the confines of the tent. The scent suffused the air, sharply and tangy. Diko hissed low and coffee's throat went dry as she suddenly noticed something near his neck. One of the loops of his harness had come under. I, coffee, reached for the loop and then stopped herself. Mama told her to make sure the harness was secure twice. If Ba saw that it wasn't now, ah, uh, Bai Matunga fanned faster, weaving her perfume around. Honestly, the smell is absolutely... It happened fast, but for coffee, it seemed to take a century. She watched one of the Diko's yellow eye flick in her direction before she suddenly lunged. Jaws snapping at Bai Matunga, sandal feet. His teeth caught the hem of her dress. She screamed, reeling back so violently, she flipped right over the back of the diwan. Mama gasped, and coffee's heart sank. Quickly, she pulled Diko away. She calmed down. Again, almost immediately, but it was too late. It it attacked me. Bai Matunga jumped over to her feet before her husband could get to her. Tears and cold streaking her face, he, she stared down at the embroidered hem of her dress, now in tatters. Then look to her husband. My love, it tried to kill me. Look what it did to my clothes. No coffee thoughts 
tangled together, unable to process what had just happened. This was very, very bad. The merchant took his wife in his arms and held her a moment before jabbing an accustomed fingers at bars. You assured me you show your wa safe, she said angrily. I was told this was a professional establishment. Bawana. Baz usually cool under pressure was stuttering. I offer my humblest, most sincere apologies. The next time you come, I assure you this won't. The next time, Bawana Mutunga brows rose, incredulous. My wife is traumatized, Baz. We have never setting foot into this wretched place again. To think we even consider supporting it. Wait, Baz's eyes went white. Wait, sir. He couldn't even finish his sentence before the merchant took his wife by the elbow and steered them out into the night. Coffee listened to the footstep until they faded. For a long moment, no one in the hammer moved. She glanced up to the sea and that the other beekeeper's eyes were all fixed on either her or Baz. It was he who broke the silence. You didn't secure him. Baz's voice was dangerously slow. No longer was... He, the jolly owner of the spectacular night zoo, now he was just Baz. Her master glaring at her, explain yourself. I coffee-headed. How small her voice sounded, she searched her mind for a decent answer but found none. The truth was she had no good answer. She hadn't secured deco harness because she had forgotten. Mama had reminded her twice but she hadn't done it. Her mind had been elsewhere so distracted by the idea of leaving. You will pay for this. Ba's words cut through her thoughts like a knife. You will go you will go to the whipping post and a fine will be added to your debt. The sum of the two tickets I just lost. By my calculation, that's about six months worth of your wages. Tears stung Coffee's eyes. The whipping post was bad enough, but for the fine six months wages she and Mama would have to stay at the night zoo. They wouldn't be leaving after all. Baz turned to one of the beast keepers near him, then pointed at Coffee. Take her out to the post now. She will learn her lesson. No. Several beast keepers started. Coffee included. For the first time, she looked to her mother. She is still standing on the, her side of the deco. There was a strange resolve in her brown eyes. No, Mama said again calmly. I am the one who forget to secure Deco's lead. The punishment and the fine should go to me. Coffee drew in a sharp breath and fought a sudden wave of pain. Mama was lying. She was going to take the blame for this, even though she hadn't been the one in the wrong. She was sacrificing herself. The literal freedom, Coffee blinked back fresh tears. Very well, Ba sneered. You can go to the post, then he waved a dismissive hand, take her away. Coffee still held Deco's leash tightly, but her fingers felt numb as she watched one of the beast keepers grab Mama by the upper arm and offer an apologetic look. Her mother held her head high, but Coffee saw it. The slight tremble in her bottom lip, the fear. No. Coffee stepped forward, her voice trembling. Mama, don't be quiet. Coffee, Mama's voice was even as their gazes met. It's all right, she gave the beekeepers another nod, more final, and she started to escort her out of the tent. With every step, Coffee felt an acute internal pain. No, it wasn't right. It wasn't fair. They had been about to leave, to be free. Now that glimmer of hope was gone, and it was her fault. Coffee grounded her teeth and started to stare at her feet, determined not to cry. This night, Zoo had stolen many things from her in 11 years. These tears would not be one of them. Her lungs strained as she took into a deep breath and held on to it fiercely. Blood roared between her eyes in the protest. Her heart pounded harder, but she refused to let the breath go. It was the smallest resistance a losing battle from the start, but she relished at the gesture. If she could control nothing else in her life for a few seconds, she would control this, the very breaths she took. A distinct sense of triumph filled her body as she finally exhaled, releasing the pressure in her chest, and then beside her, something shattered.